Good morning, Harvest. Good morning. After that, I think I feel like preaching about three hours. What do you think? <laughs> Except you all might leave through part of that, so I'll stick to the plan. Well, again, it's great to see all of you here. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Mark Davis. I, as I said during the prayer time, I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors on the uh, team here at Harvest. And if you're new, visiting with us today, haven't been here before, it is wonderful to see you here. Uh, I'd uh, love a chance to meet you after the service. I'll be in the back, so if, uh, if we have an opportunity to chat, I'd love to do that. Um, this morning, we're going to be continuing our study in uh, Judges, and we're going to be doing Chapter 7, and uh, uh, we've been, uh, we preach exegetically or word, word for word pretty much out of the Bible here, so uh, we'll be reading through that part of Judges uh, several times today, so uh, please bear with me as we do that. Um, at this time, I think I'll dismiss the uh, fourth and fifth graders to their class. I believe Amanda is standing in the back, so a few kids are ready to do that. Head on back and meet her, and at the same time, we're going to invite uh, the usher forward with Bibles, and if you need one this morning, he'll be happy to hand you one, or they will, so just, uh, just uh, raise your hands if you need one, and they'll, uh, they'll give you a copy. And uh, if you don't have a Bible of your own, and uh, please accept that one as a gift from the church if, if you need one. So I'm going to begin today with a question, and uh, it's, uh, have you ever had a wrong impression of someone? Someone that you've heard about maybe, or read about, or maybe you just saw them briefly, but from those experiences you formed an idea in your mind of what you thought they would be like. And when you got a chance to know them in more detail, a little deeper, you found that your impression was, uh, shall we say, a little off the mark. Anybody else have that happen to them? Well, I have a confession to make this morning in regard to the man Gideon that we are reading about in Judges right now. And I have read Judges and the story of Gideon more times than I can probably recall, but until we started this sermon series, I have never made a detailed study of these particular passages and critically thought through all that happened in them. My previous view of Gideon is that he was living in tough times as an Israelite, and although reluctantly at first, he did do what God asked him to do, and God performed a great miracle. When you look at this story more closely, as Pastor Nick is asking us to do, you begin to see that Gideon was not only as human as the rest of us, but at times acted in ways that were downright pagan and dishonoring to God. If you're like me, you may also have thought that Gideon was a brave man since he faced an enemy army with only 300 on his side. But we learned last week at the beginning of chapter 6 that the angel of the Lord finds Gideon beating wheat in a wine press to hide it from the Midianites, as verse 11 tells us. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Gideon was willing to go through a lot not to face opposition. In this instance, standing inside a walled winepress while beating out grain, not exactly an act of great courage, as you'll see more in a minute. Up on the screen now is a picture of a threshing floor. And it's in a clear space, and although you can't tell from this picture, this site is on a small rise or a hilltop where the wind will blow across it. The donkey in the photo pulls a flat sled over the wheat, and the worker stands on that sled, and this process grinds the stalks to loosen the grains or the berries of wheat. Side note, this process is where the proverb comes from that says, do not muzzle the ox as he treads out the grain. The animal should get a chance to eat the fruit of its labors as well. After the wheat has been ground enough, you then separate the grains from the dirt, the dust, and the chaff by tossing it in the air as this worker is doing, and the wind carries all the dirt and the dust and the chaff away. So as you can see from the picture, there's a lot of dirt and dust created. So picture brave Gideon standing inside an enclosed space with walls around it like a wine press, tossing the chaff in the air and having most of the dirt and dust stay right there with him. 
That is a lot of discomfort to endure to avoid your enemy. If you will also recall from last week, God had also asked Gideon to destroy the pagan altar to Baal and the Asherah pole in his father's quote-unquote backyard. And he did so at night to try to avoid facing his family and his fellow Israelites in the area. So not as courageous a fellow as I gave him credit for previously, but God used him anyway to accomplish his plan, bringing God the glory. Amen? So before we open our Bibles, I want to remind us of where Gideon lived and where the battle we'll read about today takes place. And he was part of the tribe of Manasseh. And I'm going to walk over here. I'm not leaving. And uh, I'm going to get Pastor Jack's patented pointer, which I have modified with an actual point. <laughs> so, uh, so Gideon's hometown would have been right about in this area. And the battle took place right up in that area, which was uh, the Jezreel Valley. I hope the arrowhead helped. So we'll talk more about uh, the Jezreel Valley in a few minutes. So at this time, please turn in your Bibles or electronic devices to Judges chapter 7. If you got one of the blue Bibles, that's on page 118. And please follow along with me, and we'll read this first time all the way through the entire chapter uh, 7 of Judges. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any one of whom I say to you, This one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand, and let all the others go every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade, and he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that it, the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. As, Gideon, as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, 
I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah towards Zerorah, as far as the border of Abel Mahola to by Tabath. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all of the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down. Excuse me, come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they captured the waters as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan, and they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. Then they pursued Midian and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. Now, we just read the portion of the story of Gideon that most people with some Bible familiarity will have heard or read at some point themselves. The events are nothing short of miraculous, and they occur in one of the most historic places on the earth. Some historians claim more battles have been fought in the Jezreel Valley than any other single place, with 34 of them recorded in Scripture and other historical writings. This valley may also be the location of the final battle spoken of in the book of Revelation. To give you a better idea of where this took place, up on the screen is a picture of the Jezreel Valley that includes both Mount Gilboa, which is near where Gideon and the Israelites camped, and the hill of Moray, which is what the Midianite army camped next to. Mount Gilboa would be on your right, and that side of the picture, and the hill of Moray is on the left. This picture was taken from Mount Carmel, which is on the western edge of the valley, which has a history of its own as well. The Jezreel Valley is a natural gateway between the Middle East, the continent of Africa, and northwest toward Turkey and then Europe. What was known as the Imperial or King's Highway passed through this area for centuries, making it a major trade route and an easy path for invading armies like the Midianites in this instance. This brings us to the first point in your outlines today. God clearly orchestrated the battle. As we read last week in chapter 6, Israel again had done evil in the sight of the Lord, and in Gideon's time, they were given over to seven years of heavy oppression by the Midianites and other peoples from the east. As Pastor Nick told us, the Midianites would invade and lay waste to the land and all the crops of the Israelites. They would gather and cross the Jordan River and follow that imperial highway into the Jezreel Valley and from there spread throughout the land. This was the first part of the Lord orchestrating this battle as he drew the Midianites and their compatriots yet again across the Jordan into Israel, and they were in appearance so numerous it was as if they were a horde of locusts. In chapter 8, we will learn that the Midianite army at the time of this event numbered 135,000. At the end of chapter 6, Gideon tested the Lord with the fleece, and God graciously responded. Immediately after those tests, at the beginning of our passage today, Gideon and all those with him headed out toward the enemy camp, as it says in verse 1. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, And all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. So on the screen now is an old black and white photograph of the spring of Herod and what is known as the cave of Gideon, which is just a little cave outcropping behind where the people are standing in the pool of water. 
And this, this uh, spring is fed from a large underground aquifer that collects rainwater, and it works its way down towards the valley and comes out at, from the, the base of this small cave, and that's roughly at the uh, northwest edge of the foot of Mount Gilboa. And I chose this picture today because the spring does not flow with nearly as much water these days. This old photo is from about 100 years ago and would be much more representative to what the folks in Gideon's day would have seen as far as a large pool of water. Coincidentally, the underground aquifer that feeds this begins in the area near Gideon's hometown of Ophrah. Now, in verse 2 of chapter 7, the Lord tells Gideon there are too many people with him. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. So God now begins his own winnowing of the people, beginning in verse 3, where he says, Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. Just, Im excuse me, just imagine you're Gideon, and you just tested God to be sure he was God, and you head out toward the enemy he has told you he would give into your hand. Now God tells you to tell everyone who may be afraid to go home. Then 22,000 of your soldiers leave. Not the usual and customary instruction from a commander before a battle. An interesting side note to add to the emphasis on the Israelites being afraid is that in verse 3 that we just read, it says, hurry away from Mount Gilead. That is a reference to the mountainous and hilly area on the other side of the Jordan River where the Midianites and the people with them would have come from. The Israelites in that day, when they heard this, they would have heard this as, you who are afraid of the Midianites can leave and go home. God is not done with his winnowing just yet. The Israelites are apparently still too many at 10,000 in number. And in verses 4 through 6, he tells Gideon to lead the remaining people down to the water of the spring where he, God, will say who should stay and who should go home. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink the water. If you recall that old picture of the spring of Haran, we had on the screen, you can get an idea of how the people could have gathered around what would have been a good-sized pool of water and a stream f flowing out of it to get a drink. Imagine again for a moment you're Gideon, and you're setting aside the two groups of people as they take their drink. And you see one group is getting very large, and the other group is very small. So which group in his heart do you think he was hoping would be going with him into battle? I know I would be wanting the larger group. As a result of this test, 9,700 are dismissed, and now only 300 remain, as it states in verse 7. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand, and let all the others go, every man to his home. Now, I do not believe there's any significance on how the people took their drink, as the chance that out of 10,000, only 300 would drink from their hands slightly defies the odds. I believe God sovereignly moved among the people and sorted down to this 300 for his own purposes, not because of anything special about each of the 300 that were chosen. As God had said earlier, this was to be for his glory. There was to be nothing the Israelites could boast over in the Lord. So now we are down to Gideon's 300 men, and in verse 8 it tells us this, so the people took their provisions in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. So on the screen now is a picture 
taken from the heights on Mount Gilead, just above the springs of Harad, looking directly at the hill of Moreh. The Midianites were camped at the base of it in the valley. This is the same view that Gideon and the Israelites would have had, except for the reservoir, which did not exist in those days. At night, the size of the Midianite camp would have looked like a city, with all the tent torches and campfires dotting the ground. The approximate distance between the Israelite and Midianite camps was around two miles. Apparently, Gideon was still afraid, although I'm not sure why, since he went from 32,000 men down to 300 in the face of an enemy of 135,000. So in case you're doing the math, the odds are 450 to 1. That means each of Gideon's men would have to slay 450 of the enemy to be victorious if they were going to do this in the usual way battles were fought in those days. Absolutely impossible odds from a human perspective, but perfect odds for a God-glorifying miracle. Further proof that God orchestrated all the events around this battle. In verses 9 through 12 of Judges 7, we see the Lord give Gideon another encouragement that the battle would be won, where we read, that same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian, and all the camp. This brings us to the second point in, in your outlines today. Human pride opposes God's glory. Now Gideon's response to hearing the dream interpretation between the two Midianites is to worship, as we see in verse 15. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped. Gideon now finally believes God but at the words coming from the mouth of the Midianites, not the same word given multiple times previously by the Lord himself. Now Gideon does worship and is inspired to lead his small group into battle against the humanly impossible, but that root of pride all men have still wants to take away from God's glory. This is further demonstrated by Gideon when he returns to the Israelite camp after his scouting mission with his servant, and he does the following in verses 15 to 18. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. Did you catch that last part of the statement? Who were they supposed to shout they were fighting for? I believe God is going to provide the victory, not Gideon. There's that human pride again, and with Gideon it manifests several times throughout the balance of his story in Judges, as we'll see. I will give Gideon his due in that he finally believed God and went back to the camp to lead this very small group against a huge army. <clears throat> Excuse me. But in his own heart, he was still struggling with the same problem that landed the Israelites in these cycles of judgment they were going through, resulting in loss of life, property, and the blessing of God. Pride is something we all battle and is the root of most of our struggles. If you think back to Pastor Jack's sermon on Judges chapters 2 to 3, he mentioned the root to fruit principle showing the image of a tree. Using that mental picture, if we have a root of pride, we are going to yield bad fruit from that and not glorify God in our walk 
as believers in Christ. Gaining victory over the root of pride is done through the sanctifying work that God, through the Holy Spirit, does in our lives from the point of salvation until we go home to be with Him. In other words, it will take time and many challenges to work it out. There are a good number of verses about pride in the Bible. This one from the New Testament book of 1 John sums it up very well. In 1 John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride in possessions is not from the Father, but from the world. Since God made each of us, He knows what is best for us. So choosing what He wants for us over what the world is tempting us with is the choice we need to make every time. But that is not easy, as, God is, as Gideon is demonstrating for us in our reading today. This is where do we, get, we get to some application points for our own lives, and it begins with the following question I'd like to ask us all. What is keeping you from doing what God is calling you to do? Gideon was called by God to be used in delivering Israel from the oppression of the Midianites, yet there were several things that God had to work through in Gideon to get him to the battle. Let's apply this to your own life with a few reflective questions I recommend you write down. Beginning with, what do you fear? If God is calling you to do something, what do you truly have to fear? Christ tells us he overcame the world, so there is nothing here on this, on this earth that should stop us, right? Easier said than done, I can tell you from firsthand experience, but the journey I have had with God, working through all the junk in my life, I would not trade for anything. Money, possessions, friends, power, nothing. I have peace, which is priceless. Now, you may be asking without thinking too deeply, what has God called me to do? I'm not Gideon, and there's no Midianite army invading my country. I take care of my family, and I do my job. So what else am I supposed to be doing? Well, I can answer that with some scriptures that we all are familiar with at this church. From Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So as believers in Christ, we all share at least one common call given by Christ himself. And all areas of our life feed into and out of this one call. So the next question, what is going on in your life? Unconfessed or secret sin? So does your lifestyle, your daily routine, what you watch, what you listen to, and how you think about others glorify God? Do you have that hidden sin that only you and God know about that you just cannot seem to get past? If so, bring it into the light of God's forgiveness and get it removed as a roadblock. Do whatever it takes to get the victory. Deprive yourself of things that lead you into that sin, even good things. Stay away from people or events that do the same. Bring in accountability from someone else, whatever it takes. The third question, what are, you do, what are you not doing? To get good fruit from a tree, back to our tree word picture, or any other plant, it must be well-nourished. For us as believers to yield good fruit unto the Lord, we also need to be well-nourished spiritually. That means there are things that we need to do to get that nourishment, such as meeting together with other believers regularly, church, time studying God's Word, memorizing Scripture, prayer, and worship, just to name a few. So I would ask, are you doing all these things with intent and purpose, or do some need improved upon so you can be better equipped to do what God has called you to do? And the last question, is pride standing in your way? Do you want a share of the glory? Do you struggle with that common Western and American problem of prideful independence? I do. 
you can do it in your own strength kind of thinking. I don't need to go to church regularly. I watch it on TV. I don't need accountability for my spiritual walk. I can manage on my own. I can overlook this little problem area of my life. I do good in other areas to cover it. This is all rooted in pride, that age-old sin that goes right back to the beginning with Adam and Eve. The cure for pride is humility. To get there means surrender of those areas of your life that you have not yet fully yielded to Christ. Am I personally completely yielded to Christ in all areas of my life? I would be the first to tell you emphatically, no. There is still more work to be done by the Holy Spirit in my life. I realize it will be a continuous work until, as the scriptures say, Christ will complete it in the twinkling of an eye. But until that day arrives, I plan to guard my heart and surrender all those areas that I need to as God reveals them to me. I pray the same for all of you. So we now have arrived at the last point in your outlines today, and that is God provided the victory. So we now turn back to the final section of our passage in Judges 7 today, the battle Gideon and the Israelites have with the Midianites on this side of the Jordan River. We left off with Gideon returning to the Israelite camp, encouraging his 300 men and giving them instructions, and then they head out in three companies of 100 men each and encircle the enemy camp. We will read through the end of the passage, beginning with verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp. And all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah towards Zerah, as far as the border of Abel Mahola by Tabath. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they captured the waters as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. And they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. Then they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. What an amazing victory for the Lord and for Israel. Now, I will not break this section down in great detail due to the constraints of time, but I did want to point out several things from the passage that I think are of particular interest. So up on the screen now is an overview map of the battle, and from the absence of contrary text in the Scriptures, it appears that the tactical or the detailed plan of the battle was Gideon's, but no doubt inspired by the Lord. The first large group of arrows going from around Israel into the valley are where the tribes originally gathered. Then the very small little arrow is Gideon's 300. And then the arrows leading out of the camp and going down the map, the black ones, that's the fleeing Midianite army. And the blue arrow on the bottom is Ephraim coming out and cutting off part of their retreat across the Jordan River, as the scriptures tell us. So note in verse 19 that the attack came at the start of the middle watch, which would have been around 10 o'clock at night in the dark. Watch change or changing of the guards is a great time to catch your enemy by surprise. Note also there were no instructions to Gideon's 300 to enter the camp or draw any weapons. But the 300 men stood in their place around the camp, blew their trumpets, smashed their jars, made their shout, and the enemy cried out and fled. Also note that they were instructed to encircle the enemy camp and blow their trumpets from every side. So mental picture, 300 men encircling a camp of 135,000. 
this means there would have been pretty good gaps in the line between each of the guys. Now, the Midianites would have been backed up to the base of the hill, so maybe not a true square. Maybe it was three sides, but that still would require a lot of courage on the part of each of the 300 to stand out there, probably not even hardly be able to see the guy that's next to you. The Lord then caused the Midianites to, uh, to, just, to flee, to be scared, to turn their swords upon one another. So they basically began defeating themselves in the face of the Israelites. Gideon then also summoned the nearby tribes as the army was on the run to cut off the retreat across the Jordan River and pursue the enemy, where two of the Midianite princes were captured and killed, making for a complete victory on this side of the Jordan River, where the scriptures tell us the enemy lost 120,000 men that night. Unbelievable to our human understanding, but nothing too difficult for our God. Amen? A note of interest on the two Midianite princes. One was killed by a rock, and the other by a wine press. If you recall last week, we read that the present Gideon offered the angel of the Lord was burned up when fire came from the rock it was set on, and the angel of the Lord met Gideon in a wine press. Not coincidences. We will draw some application for our own lives from this miraculous victory God gave the Midianites, or excuse me, gave the Israelites. My previous question was what is keeping you from doing what God has called you to do? And I listed some questions we all need to reflect on, considering God's calling on each of our lives. To bring this home, considering the victory God brought the Israelites, I would like to conclude this message with the following encouragements for all of us. You can do what God has called you to do. As many of you have heard before from Scripture, with God... Anything is impossible. Is possible. There is no difficulty, as evidenced by Gideon's events, there is no gif- difficulty he cannot bring you through. I have selected three scriptures to help, help us keep that in mind as you look at the calling God has placed on your own life. The first one is this, from 1 Samuel 15, 22, where God is looking for obedience over sacrifice. 1 Samuel 15, 22, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. God is looking for you to be obedient in doing what he calls you to do. Do not get caught up in ritual, ceremony, or any other excuses that you may be using. Don't put your own conditions on doing something you know God is prompting you to do. Avoid the if-then mindset. If God does this, then I will do that. Be obedient, and you will be blessed. The second verse is from Isaiah 41.10. God is looking for, excuse me, God will empower you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. If God is calling you to do something, he will give you what you need. Fear not, he will uphold you. God will not call you to something that he has not prepared you for or will not carry you through. I can tell you that with complete assurance. This does not mean that everything he calls you Two, will be a grand, glorious victory like Gideon's battle. As a matter of fact, some things will seem far from that. But if you are obedient, he, be, he will be with you through it all. And the last verse is from Ephesians 2.10. God saves you and prepares you for the works that he has called you to. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here is the confirmation. You are his workmanship. You were created to do what he already prepared before you even became a believer in him. What a gracious, loving, and awesome God we have and serve. Please join me in prayer as we close this morning.